Good afternoon and uh, welcome once again to our edition of Lunchtime Devotion. Yesterday we completed the Gospels, uh, which we are studying the New Testament in chronological order. And uh, Pastor started with uh, 11 verses, I think, of uh, Acts chapter 1. So from today onwards, and uh, probably for the next uh, couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, we will be studying the book of Acts. So I thought it appropriate that we do a quick overview of what the book of Acts is, at least part of the book of Acts. Uh, so we'll have a better understanding as the days go by and we get a deeper and better understanding of Acts. The book of Acts. It's the second volume of a unified two-part work that today we call Luke-Acts. These were written by the same author, Luke, who was a traveling co-worker with Paul. This is clear from the book's introduction where Luke says, I produced my first volume, that's the gospel, about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now Luke's giving a clue here as to what this book of Acts will be about. Volume 1 was about what Jesus began to do and to teach. Volume 2 will then be about what Jesus continued to do and teach. Which leads to a really interesting point about the book's traditional but not original name, the Acts of the Apostles. While different apostles do appear in most of these stories, the only single character who unifies the whole story from beginning to end is Jesus himself, acting directly or through the Spirit. And so the book would more accurately be named The Acts of Jesus and the Spirit. The book's introduction recounts how the risen Jesus spends some 40 days with the disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God. This connects back to the story of Luke's gospel, where Jesus claimed that he was restoring God's kingdom over the world, beginning with Israel. So he called Israel to live under God's reign by following him. And he was enthroned as king when he gave up his life and then conquered death with his love. And so the book of Acts begins with the risen King Jesus instructing his disciples about life in his kingdom. So he promises that the Spirit will soon come and immerse them in his personal presence. And this fulfills one of the key hopes from the Old Testament prophets, that in the Messianic kingdom, God's presence, his Spirit, would come and take up residence among his people in a new temple and transform their hearts. And so Jesus says, when this happens, the Spirit will empower his disciples to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. From here, Jesus is taken up from their sight in a cloud. It's an image drawn from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. It shows how Jesus is now being enthroned as the Son of Man who was vindicated after his suffering and now shares in God's rule over the world. And so he promises that he will return one day. And so the main themes and the design of the book of Acts flow right out of this opening chapter. This is a story about Jesus leading his people by the Spirit to go out into the world and invite all nations to live under his reign. And so the story will begin with that message spreading in Jerusalem and then into the neighboring regions of Judea and Samaria full of non-Jewish people. And then from there out to all of the nations into the ends of the earth. Okay, that was just a small part, right? It's a longer introduction, probably at a later time uh, during the weeks ahead, we will play the second part. But this just tells us uh, just a bit uh, about the uh, whole book of Acts. And uh, in essence, uh, we all know that the book of Acts, uh, more appropriately, should be renamed uh, the Acts, not of the apostles, but the Acts of the Holy Spirit. But in any event, we can see that it is, uh, as the, uh, we read the book, it is in three parts, you can see quite clearly Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, even as we reach the final chapters. Let's uh, go on to the next part. All right, uh, Pastor yesterday at length uh, dwelt on the, what it is, uh, the great empowerment. Remember, he mentioned, uh, and uh, we discussed at length, Receiving power when the Holy Spirit comes, not if. Right? It's a fulfillment, it's a promise. And you will be my witnesses. It is actually part of uh, a three-part uh, charge, a three-part commission given to us. Uh, you will notice that it also 
connected to the Great Commission. All of us know uh, it's uh, in Matthew 28, not Matthew 2. Huh? Go make disciples. That is the commission. And which actually is a follow-up on the Great Commandment. Huh? No more uh, 600 over do's and don'ts according to the Mosaic Law or the Old Covenant. But with the New Covenant, when Jesus was on earth here, he told the disciples and to us also, very simply, the great commandment is a two-part commandment. Love God, love your neighbor. And if you love God and love your neighbor, what do you do about it? You go and make disciples of what? You're just your neighbors? No, of everyone, of all nations. How by baptizing them? And making disciples, easier said than done. You cannot do it alone. You will do it under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And one good way to make disciples is to testify of God's goodness, to be witnesses of His goodness and faithfulness. Okay? Bookmark this at the back of your mind while we go on to what seems to be a digression. A couple of weeks ago, I attended a seminar by FGB on branding. And this uh, Pyramid would be very familiar to uh, many of the marketing practitioners among us. Right at the top of the pyramid would be sales, and then underneath would be marketing, and the whole foundation is branding. So sales, in essence, is uh, what? What do we sell? What do we want to promote, to sell our ideas, our principles, our products, our services? And the marketing boys undergirding this effort will be sharing how do we do it marketing and sales huh? as uh, my, many of you will know are slightly different the marketing is all about the how and finally you are not alone in this there are other people other brands other services and that's why branding is very important it will help people decide why do they want to buy your product your service what is the brand they want to look to so now we merge the two together, sales, marketing, branding, pyramid with the great commandment, the great commission, and the great empowerment. We have this belief, this uh, value that we hold very dear, that Jesus is the way. Jesus has, is the savior and he will give us all that we need in this world and the next. So that is what we want to sell. But how do we do it? It is through the Great Commission by making disciples. And then the great empowerment is when we tell them, what is the brand? Jesus. Jesus is the only way. And this is when we become witnesses through the Holy Spirit. And the brand we want to introduce to the world is Jesus and Jesus. Jesus alone. Huh? That is the brand. So we start here on uh, continuing on verse 12 huh? in Acts chapter 1. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Acts chapter 1, starting from verse 12. So reading NIV. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem. A Sabbath day's journey. What is this Sabbath day's journey? We'll come to it. And when they entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So here we read, they return to Jerusalem. Huh? They were all natives of Galilee, but they returned to Jerusalem. Why? This was notable, something worth noting, obedience. Jesus told them to return to Jerusalem and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Huh? In verse 4, yesterday we read. And that is exactly what they did. They didn't forget the sermon right after they heard it. They actually did what Jesus told them, even though he was no longer physically present with them. 
and then we read a several days journey. Mount of Olives is just outside uh, Jerusalem walls and gates, and this is a short distance. And the kind of journey that you can do, you are allowed to do on Sabbath. You remember Sabbath, huh? you can't do a lot of things, not allowed to work, but there are certain uh, uh, dispensations. A short journey, which called a Sabbath later, you are allowed. And in this case, the traveling from Mount Olives to Jerusalem allowed. So when they entered, they went into the upper room, and it tells us 120 people were present. This, of course, included the 11 disciples, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, the biological brothers of Jesus, and the women who followed Jesus, and there were others also. The biological brothers of Jesus actually never seemed to be supportive of his ministry before his death and resurrection. But after encountering the resurrected Jesus, they were changed into true followers of Jesus. Point to note, an encounter with God surely will bring about transformation. Right, and then Kevin uh, talks about with the women, meaning with their wives, uh, not just uh, other women, but the wives of the apostles were also present. And they continue with one accord. Just now something to note, obedience. And then now it's unity, fellowship. Notable unity. We saw the disciples in the uh, Gospels huh, appearing always to be bickering, missing the point, a bit blur. What had changed? Peter still had the history of denying the Lord. Matthew still a tax collector. Simon still a zealot. The differences were there. But the resurrected Jesus in their hearts was greater than any difference. And we notice. This was also notable prayer. They continued in one accord. The unity is there. The obedience is there. They continued in prayer and supplication. Our supplication is crying out to God. A sense of desperation and earnestness. So, take home. We have three important steps when we want to make godly decisions. Here, the apostles, huh, they were at an important point ministry they will have to make important godly decisions and these three points were helping them very much they were in obedience they were in fellowship and unity and prayer always undergirded and then we skip to chapter 2 verse 1 the disciples were filled with the holy spirit when the day of pentecost had come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing wind and it filled the whole house they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them. A tongue of fire on each of the disciples or of those gathered there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So day of Pentecost, this was a Jewish feast held 50 days after the Passover, celebrated with first fruits of wheat hours, wheat. Huh? And uh, the Jewish rituals at that time says that the first sheaf reaped from the barley harvest presented to God at Passover. But at Pentecost, the first fruits of the wheat harvest were presented. Huh? In any event, first fruits, very important. And it's also Jewish tradition that the Pentecost mark the day when the law was given to israel the nation of israel huh? in the old old testament day of pentecost israel received the law in the new testament new covenant day of pentecost the church the gathering there was actually the church already huh? received the spirit of grace in fullness actually it was the best attended of all the feasts because traveling conditions uh, at that time were good and there was never more a uh, more cosmopolitan crowd gathering in Jerusalem than this one at that time, huh? 1.5 million different people from different groups. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, here it is, huh? 10 days after ascension, 10 days after Jesus ascended to heaven, and 
since Jesus commanded them to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So, first point is the disciples, they were not strangers to the person of the Holy Spirit, to the work of the Holy Spirit. They had actually seen the Holy Spirit working continually during the earthly ministry of Jesus. So, they also experienced something of the power of the Spirit. Right? In Luke, we read, when they stepped out and served God, miracles happening. And they also heard Jesus promise a new and coming work of the Holy Spirit, John 14. And they received the Holy Spirit in a new way after Jesus finished his work on the cross and instituted the new covenant in his blood, a sacrament of the Last Supper. So the disciples heard Jesus command them to wait, to wait for a promised baptism of the Holy Spirit that will do what? Empower them to be witnesses. They waited until the day of Pentecost had fully come. They did not know ahead of time how long they have to wait. It would be easy for them to think uh, three days, maybe at the most seven days. But they had to wait a full ten days until that fateful day fully come. So the only possible scriptural precedent for this would be probably in Jeremiah 42. Ten days later, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. But who would have suspected them? Who would have connected? God used this time to break them down and to build them up. Also, we can imagine the patience, the kindness, the compassion was tested during this time. Yet, they all stayed together. So, this, what does this passage tell us about the gift of the Holy Spirit? Uh, if you see here on the screen, it is the gift of the Holy Spirit is promised to us. God does not make break promises. Jesus did not and will not break his promise. And the gift of the Holy Spirit worth waiting for. And the gift of the Holy Spirit comes as he wills and not according to our expectation and not at our back and call. And also, the gift of the Holy Spirit can come upon not only individuals, but also in groups. Later, we will see uh, in uh, Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 10, we see this in evidence. And then the gift of the Holy Spirit is often given as God deals with the flesh and there's a dying to self. Remember, the 10 days was a time of dying to self. So, what this passage does not tell about the gift of the Holy Spirit, two things. The gift of the Holy Spirit is not given according to a formula. You do this, you do this, boom, you will get that. Or, you can earn the gift by your continuing. It is a gift of God. The grace of the Holy Spirit. Huh? And then we read, they were all with one accord in one place. They were gathered together, hear this, with the same heart with the same love for God, the same trust, and the same geography. Huh? Location-wise, they're all together. So, before we can be filled, we must recognize our emptiness. We must recognize our brokenness so that the Spirit can fill us, can mend us, can build us. And this we do by gathering together for prayer in obedience. And the disciples did just that. They recognized that huh, they did not have the resources in themselves to do what they could do, they should do, or they will be doing. They knew they had to rely on the work of God. And that is the Holy Spirit. And then we hear a very, we read a very vivid description of the Holy Spirit. There was a sound from heaven. The sound of what? A rushing mighty wind. Not just in one small corner, one filling the whole house. And that would be a bit unusual. But here it's important to note, the, it probably has connection with the fact that Hebrew, Greek, Latin, the word for spirit is the same for breath and wind. We all know, huh? Pneuma. And the sound of this fast mighty wind would make any of these men and women, these people, they knew their scriptures, huh? 
think of the presence of the Holy Spirit, it would click. Huh? And then, why? In Genesis, we read of the Spirit of God as the breath blowing over the waters. And then in Genesis 2, the breath of God blowing life into the new man, newly created man, Adam. And then in Ezekiel, the Spirit of God, the breath, the wind of God moving over dry bones, bringing them to life and to strength. Huh? So here we, that single line tells us how the Holy Spirit moves. Number one, suddenly. Uh, I think sermons have been preached about suddenly. Sometimes God moves suddenly. I don't know. This pandemic, was it planned for? Were we expecting it suddenly? And then the sound, it was real, though it could not be touched, but it came through. And the ears could hear it. The bodies could actually feel the wind. And it wasn't made in Jerusalem. It wasn't made anywhere nearby. It was from heaven. It wasn't of earth. Neither created or manipulated. Huh? It came from heaven. God's gift. The gift of grace and power. It was mighty. Full of power. Full of force. And then we read about the divided tongues as of fire and set upon each one of them. These divided tongues as of fire came over each one. Very important. Huh? And then it's probably connected with John the Baptist's prophecy. Remember that Jesus would baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So the imagery of fire is very often purification. How many of us know that you use extreme heat to make pure gold or it burns away what is temporary what is of no use remember the twigs that the vineyard of no use you'll be burned and so here we see an excellent illustration of the principle of the feeling of the holy spirit is not just abstract power but also purifying purifying effect and then we read in the OT, God shows his pleasure with the sacrifice by lighting the fire for himself. Do you remember? Fire from heaven came down, consumed the sacrifice. It is to show his pleasure and his power. And then we read, the Holy Spirit sat upon each of them. And sat here has a marked force in the New Testament. It carries the idea of a complete preparation and a certain permanence of position and condition. Uh, it is a permanent thing. The day we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the day we repented and said, yes, Lord, I want you into my life, that is the day the Holy Spirit comes. When we empty it of ourselves and say, Holy Spirit, you take over and it is that permanence of position, all right? So under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit rested on God's people as a nation, more as a nation, Israel. But under the new covenant, the Holy Spirit rests on God's people as individuals. This strange phenomenon had never happened before and would never happen again in the pages of the Bible, but was given to emphasize this point that the Spirit of God was present with and in and upon each individual. One more time. The Spirit of God was present with each one. The Spirit of God was present in each one. And the Spirit of God was present upon each one. And we too can claim privy to this. This too is our privilege. The day we accepted Jesus. The Spirit of God, that is the promise, will be present with each of us. He will be present in us. And that power will be upon us. It is a fulfillment of promise. We have received it in faith, in God's timing, and 
within a group and that uh, narration together in unity but yet individually and in different unique ways and then continuing in verse uh, second part of uh, verse 4 to 13 we read of the speaking of tongues we do not have time to dwell on this but i think uh, months ago or last year we uh, studied at length uh, on uh, tongues what is it for why different types of tongue and for what purpose uh, so we will not uh, dwell on that and the reaction was actually quite different uh, from the people who were outside they heard what is it that they are speaking the galileans are uh, generally those from galilee they were not known to be cultured and they were not known to be eloquent speakers but yet you know, it's not only eloquently but they spoke in different tongues you remember different ethnic groups were present in jerusalem and when they saw and heard this a lot of questions came in but there were also some mistaken interpretations as saying they were drunk so right here a great miracle happening before them others were amazed were marvel and beginning to question but there were others who just say no lah, they were drunk how true it is today also huh? and it was not the 120 who were preaching to the crowds the gathered crowd merely overheard what the disciples were declaring what they were exuberant exuberantly declaring to god and they overheard and they could understand because it was in their language in their mother tongue and this we learned that was one of the great things that happened and we end our reading in verse 13 and tomorrow in verse 14 we will read what happens next when peter the new peter the spirit-filled peter stood up raised his voice and addressed the crowd so stay tuned tomorrow